You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Chalupa for you guys. Good morning, Bruce. Morning, Bruce. Welcome, everybody, to the Doonstie for your fiction magazine. Australia, 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 we love you. Amen. I'm your host, Bruce Outfield. And I'm Bruce Anklevich. Welcome to the show. Today is episode number 139. Uh, Today we've got a lovely show for you. I, uh, I wouldn't go that far. Don't set them up for something we can't pay off. Oh, sorry. Just that we have a show. Okay. Today we've got a show for you. It's uh, another story by one of our favourite authors, Rick Kinnett. How do I know Rick Kinnett, Bruce? Well, let me tell you, Bruce. Rick Kinnett has been on the show several times. He's now got two separate series running on our show. First, there's the Ernie Pine Ghost Hunter stories. All right. My accent's terrible. It's got to be some kind of a mix in between... uh, Chinese and Canadian. Yes, it's exactly what I was going for. And also, today we've got another Seidegert story for you. It's called The Road to Utopia Plain by Rick Kinnett. Australia, Australia, Australia. We love you. Amen. Uh, I almost called you big there. Uh, Bruce... (laughs) Tell the the listener wh- where they can hear the first side of good story. Well, the first story is way the hell back, episode one hundred, a very special episode because it's a round number, and that's the one where Dudley gets molested by the bicycle shop owner. That's right. That's right. A very special episode of Blossom. Is that correct? No, no, it was the wrong show. Announcer man. I doubt it. Uh, Bruce. Nancy <laughs> Man Bruce. Announcer Bruce. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay. All right. So, yes, you can hear the first one there. And, of course, there'll be a link in the show notes. Maybe we should move along to the story now. Can you give me an excuse to stop using this terrible voice? Uh-huh. Well, why don't you tell us who produced today's story? Okay. Today's episode was produced by the lovely and talented. That's That's sexist. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase. The talented and lovely Renee Chambliss. Oh, she's a good Sheila Bruce and not at all stuck up. (laughs) Amen. She has done several voices for us and she's done a couple of uh, productions before, although I'm not sure that any were this uh, uh, well in doubt. (laughs) None of that talk now. You stink. Don't all your friends smoke pipes? Yeah, so uh, without any further ado... We're going to go straight on into the story. We've got stuff to say, but we're going to go ahead and leave that for after. As there was a time that we once used to leave things for after the story. We're going to try and make this intro short for once. And now that I've rambled for so long about leaving things for after, it's not short anymore. Stop farting! You're killing me! I cannot help myself! You all right? I learned it by watching you. (laughs) How about telling me about today's author? Oh, dang it. I always forget that part. Okay. Rick Kennett, an eccentric billionaire in the mythical kingdom of Australia. Oh, we love you. Amen. Uh, Lurks within his storm-wracked castle, dreaming up outrageous lies about himself, and occasionally writing stories, some of which have appeared, or are about to appear, most, I'm sure, by now have already appeared, in Arialis. What? Midnight Echo. Devil Dolls and Duplicates. Oh, cool. And Pseudopod. Uh Uh-huh. The Road to Utopia Plane was originally published in Eidolon number 15 in 1994. Republished in the first edition of Beyond SF in May 1995. And then in Transversions number 8 slash 9 in 1998 where it was described as a haunting SF romance. Spoilers! <laughs> okay, announcer man, what do we do now? You'll have to move along to the story now. Okay, on with the story, for real this time. The Road to Utopia Plain by Rick Kennett Sam 
Sometimes it's caused by solar flares, and sometimes by the passing echoes of distant novas. And sometimes it happens for no reason at all. Five seconds before Utopia Plane kicked back into real space, just beyond the orbit of Saturn, a subspace distortion wave shocked through the solar system at many times the speed of light. In that instant, time and space flexed and altered. The starship's exit hole stretched along her trajectory so that she bulleted back into reality, not in safe, empty space, but on an imminent collision course with Mars. Gravity rings back rippled down her hull in frantic deceleration. Inwardly rotating, tilted to their maximum, they pushed simultaneously against every atom passing through them, causing no G-forces within. Her course began to alter, slowly. But Mars, in less than 30 seconds, had swelled on the ship's screens from a distant star to a rushing disk to a very solid planet. 30 seconds later, she clipped the western edge of the atmosphere. Settlements at Cassius and Neath to the west, and on the Isidius and Elysium plains in the east, saw her as a flash of white and silver racing an arc across their skies as she ricocheted off the atmosphere and belted back into space. Utopia Plain dropped out of the pink noonday sky of Mars and belly cradled in Styx City, 1,300 kilometers southeast of the rocky desert from which the starship took her name. Medical personnel boarded and removed five injured crew members. Shortly afterward, the rest of the crew left for a suddenly well-deserved shore leave. Lieutenant Cy de Gerch, the ship's second in command and the second last to leave before repair technicians took charge, stepped through the forward hatch and walked down the pressure tunnel with her bag slung over his shoulder. Captain Brown ambled down after her, joining his young lieutenant at the spaceport windows where they looked ruefully back at the scorched, buckled metal of their ship. A close one, said Brown. De Gerch said nothing to this. There was nothing to say. She was the navigator and knew intimately how close it had been. It wasn't just atmospheric burning and damage, though there was enough of that in evidence. The ring drive had had the guts pulled out of it, had in fact begun to discharge energy through the hull as the damage showed. The results of a full burnout would have been catastrophic. Funny how these things happen, Si, said Brown. Something that's commonplace, routine, done a thousand times. One day nearly kills you. De Gerch nodded thoughtfully. A minute either way on our emergence, and we would never have known how close we'd come to dying. She shivered. All the nearlies that happen every day we're never aware of. Abruptly formal, she said. Permission to leave, sir. Permission granted. Going home? To Phobos? Probably. Haven't seen Dad in months. He'd probably like to know his only daughter is still alive. Then again, I might just go back to my place at South Me and Hermit. We've got twenty days. I'll see. De Gerch snapped a salute, hefted her bag, and hurried off. As her footsteps receded, others approached. Dr. Norsk, gray and smiling, said, Five out of five, Ralph. Sticks Hospital should be releasing the last of our injured in an hour. <sighs> we were lucky today, Ben. Depends on how you look at it, Ralph. I'd rather it had been one of those could-have-beens we never know about. That's what Saw just said. Then young de Gerch must be a philosopher as well as everything else the Gartino geneticist made her. One of Norsk's paramedics popped her head through the doorway leading to the next landing cradle. Shuttle to Earth's boosting in 15 minutes, Doctor. Thank you, Helen, Norsk replied. You know, Ralph, he said to Brown, it's been a long time since I was home. I've had a fifth generation added to my family since we left. He produced a data wafer from his pocket. I picked this up from the comm office on the way back from the hospital. Seems my great-granddaughter in Montreal had a baby boy a month ago. Congratulations, Ben, said Brown, knowing that when Norsk, the only Earther in his crew, spoke of months, it was certain he meant Earth's 30-day version, not the local 57 variety. Everyone seems to be going back to family. Except you? Well, I might have thought Evelyn would meet me here. Or I would have got some message from her. I suppose there was nothing for me at the comm office. 
Sorry, no. Not to worry. For the moment, I've got her to babysit. He glanced meaningfully through the window at his ship. My regards to your wife when you give her a beating for being so remiss. As Norsk left, he gave the captain a salute that was more an airy wave. Brown watched his friend depart with a tolerant smile, knowing Norsk would never be Navy if he lived a second 100 solar years. Sida Gurch, who hadn't quite lived 18 solar years and genetically couldn't help but be Navy, had picked up two wafers at the spaceport, and as the monorail slid out of Styx City for South Me, she fished in her tunic pocket for them. The one she brought out had been sent from Phobos. She thumbed it on. Its surface glistened, swirled, and formed into the thin face of a middle-aged man. He smiled and said, Welcome home, Sai. A simple message from a straightforward man, her father. The face dissolved into color swirl, ready to start again. On impulse, Sai glanced upward through the window in the vain hope of catching a glimpse of the little moon she still called home. There was nothing to be seen in the daytime sky but wisps of white cloud. The cityscape passed at a growing pace, the above-ground portions of buildings and dwellings, the marching line of windmill power plants and their wide-swinging blades, the red sand roads, the balloon wheel vehicles. Faster and faster, the exit from the city's artificial gravity, the last buildings whizzing by, windmills flicking past like fence posts. The outside blurred green and yellow with the glassed-in farmlands of sugar beet, soybean, corn, and wheat. Then constant red, rushing red like gushing blood, the unadulterated surface of Mars. The monorail swept out across the red wilderness and in less than a minute was over the horizon and gone. The door lock of her subsurface flat identified her palm print with a cheery chime and opened. She stopped and looked into the flat, looked carefully at everything in it. It was all wrong. Not that anything had been disturbed, everything was in order, but it was the wrong order. Two chairs faced each other where there should have been one in the corner. Between these was a table. She had a table, yes, but this was a different color, a different shape. There was a large hologram hanging on the wall. Jose Manxman and herself two years ago, togged up in full vacuum suits, standing on the cone edge of Mount Olympus, the mighty volcano far to the east. Its crater stretched away in white clouds, lost over the horizon. We're standing on the shores of space, Jose had said. They'd been 25 kilometers above the mean datum of Mars and in virtual vacuum. That hollow was the one taken during a long hike during a long leave, the first of many such adventures they'd planned together for the discovery of their planet and each other, a first adventure which proved to be their only. That hollow was the one which used to hang there, the one she'd taken down nearly a year ago and rehung in her cabin aboard Utopia Plain. Sai moved slowly into the room, running her hands over the furnishings. She glanced up the spiral stairs leading to the observation or sunroom which protruded through the surface. Were there chairs up there? She didn't have any chairs up there. In the bedroom, she found the twin set she'd gotten rid of after Jose died. There were articles of clothing lying on the quilt. Bright red blouse, yellow slashed metallic skirt, bathrobe of chaotic color and pattern. Not her clothes. Too bright. More the thing untidy Jose with her liking for flashy... Psy caught herself. These things had not been worn by Jose, had not been left there by Jose. Josephine Manxman was dead, had been dead a solar year. In her clothes closet, she found her civilian wear stored more or less the way she'd left them 60 days ago. She hesitated with her hand on the door of the other closet, the one which should be empty. Don't be silly, she told herself. She dived into her own closet and picked out some house clothes. It was while changing out of operational fatigues that Sai discovered the second data wafer she'd picked up at the spaceport. Puzzling. It had been sent from the Zephyria terraforming base down on the equator. She was sure she knew no one there. But there was no mistake. It had her name on it. Thumbing it, she watched with growing disbelief as the familiar head and shoulders of a young woman with auburn hair appeared and said, My darling... I need to be with you soon, especially after what nearly happened to you today. Your way of life 
frightens me sometimes. Sigh. I have seven days leave, and I'll be on the evening northbound Wano. If we have the strength later, as promised, we'll hike to Viking. Love you. Sai paced the monorail platform, listening to her own loud breathing in her oxygen helmet. South Mi was a small settlement on the eastern edge of the Utopia Plain, huddling on the southern slopes of the massive Mi crater. It sported no fancy pressurized station like the big towns, such as Stick City. South Mi was lucky to have artificial gravity. At first, she'd been shocked, thinking the message a cruel hoax. Then, replaying the wafer again and again, she didn't know what to think. She'd called South Mi's administration and, using voice ID, accessed tenant information on her own flat. Who lived there? The computer had answered in deceptively human tones. De Gertz, Silene J. Manxman, Josephine S. What are their occupations? The computer replied. Lieutenant, Defense Force, Interstellar Fleet. Geologist in Training, Department of the Environment, Zephyria. She looked at the data wafer message for a long time, watched the face, heard the voice, looked at the hollow on the wall, at the bright, flashy clothes scattered about the bedroom. As evening drew in, she donned her vacuum suit and gone outside. Every now and again, Sai stared down the monorail platform into the south, which was now fading into deep black. It has to be a hoax, in which case I'm acting like a fool coming here. But who could be so cruel? On the other hand, if it's true, no, it can't be. It's impossible. The dead don't come back in corporeal form. The dead don't make wafers. The dead don't travel about on the mono. And yet, here I am, waiting. It was curiosity, she told herself. I'm just curious to see what might happen. But what if Jost does come? Maybe she hadn't been killed in that accident. I never saw the body. Of course not. No one had seen the body. There'd been nothing to see after that meteor had hit her scout ship. She was clutching at irrational straws and knew it. Way down in the south was a faraway dot of light, coming nearer, growing larger, almost here, growing to a headlamp, slowing to a stop. A figure alighted and moved down the platform toward her. With that peculiar half-shuffle denoting those recently returned to artificial gravity after a long period in the natural 0.38G of Mars, such as might be experienced at the Zephyria terraforming base. Sai told herself not to be silly, that it couldn't be Jost, that it couldn't be, couldn't be, couldn't, and tried to ignore the fluttering in her stomach, the way her breathing grew faster in her mask. Then the figure raised a hand and waved. Dreamlike, Sai began to move. Dreamlike, rational thought was firmly suppressed. And Sai, still thinking, Couldn't be, couldn't be, couldn't, ran down the platform to hug Joe's Manxman, returned who cares how from the dead. Sai de Gertz awoke, and for several seconds stared vacantly into the darkness. Had it all been just an erotic dream? The joy of return, sharp and overpowering logic, few words, their passion speaking all that was needed. Sex had them eventually tired and happily asleep in one another's arms. She wavered between disappointment and fear, disappointment that she had dreamt it all, fear that she had not. She reached out a hand, then pulled it back before it touched anything. What if there's a skeleton lying beside me? What if it's something else entirely, pretending? She was being irrational again. Yet to expect Jost to be there was equally so. Last night, physical sensation had been everything. Now, with the shock of surprise over and the lust in her blood gone, she had time to think. Sliding quietly from beneath the covers, she made her way into the living room, where she collided noisily with the table. Damn! She fell back into a chair, holding a stubbed toe. She'd forgotten the altered layout of her flat. She listened for a full minute, but there was no reaction from Jose. No. She got to her feet. That was not Jose. Jose Manxman was dead and spread thin in the asteroid belt, and that was not her in there. 
She had not spent half the night fucking her dead lover. She would march in there. She would turn on the light. She would say... She had no idea what she would say. She sat down again. Code lights, wall, soft. She murmured, and the walls emitted a gentle glow. At least environmental verbal controls were still the same, she thought, regarding the room. It was like someone else's room with someone else's furniture, someone else's taste, and someone else's way of arranging things. It was as if she were in the wrong place. It was as if she were the one... She stopped, considering the thought a moment, and laughed with the shock of so simple an understanding. Yes, that was it. Nothing was wrong. Nothing was out of place. Everything was as it should be, including Jos Manxman. She, Saida Gurch, was the one out of place. She was the one who shouldn't be there. But how? The subspace distortion wave? Was she clutching again, or was this the only thing that made halfway sense? Had that wave pushed time sideways? Yes. She believed it. Yes, it had to be. Yes, this wasn't what is. This was what could have been. Smiling, weeping unawares, Sai verbaled off the lights and climbed back into bed with Joe's, cuddling her warmth, burying her face in her auburn hair. Don't ever go away from me again, she whispered into her ear. The Utopia Plain, an immensity of rocky desert, stretched rust-red before them in the freezing midday sun of the following day. Their destination, 200 kilometers due west, was the historic landing site of Viking II, one of the first probes to reach Mars. Jose had woken that morning with the sunrise and gotten ready for the hike. Very matter-of-fact, not at all like someone returned from oblivion. Sai helped ready their vacuum suits and backpacks in a mechanical way, lost in a mixed sensation of joy and unreality, smiling like an idiot. Before they left, they touched base with South Me admin for weather information. As Jose, awkward in her suit under artificial gravity, went through the airlock to the surface, Sai made a call to her captain's private number on her suit's radio. Neutrino beam communication needed no satellite relays, but simply passed through solid matter, including whole planets, as if it wasn't there. Unfortunately, Captain Brown wasn't there either. Just his receive and record signal. He was probably in conference with the spaceport's repair people. She left a message. I think that distortion wave has put us a whole other place than where we think we are. Check with Mr. Womack of the 5D room. There was a road of sorts, bulldozed west, packed sand and buried rock. They traveled with the long, easy lope appropriate to the Martian gravity, across between a step and a jump. The Utopia Plain was a sometimes undulating, more often flat expanse, scattered with a monotony of rocks ranging from fist size to boulders. Very occasionally, a hummock or knob would mark the remains of a long-dead volcano. The Utopia Plain's main feature is that it's virtually featureless, said Jose, ever the new geologist. Wind erosions wiped off all the early craters. It's so old, sigh, you can almost feel the weight of time on the Utopia Plain. Once in a long while, one of the more recent impact sites, Later Craters, Jose called them, loomed over the horizon and became an occasion for comment. But as the day progressed, they saved their breath for the hike and played popular and classical music through their helmet phones. It was this isolation that gave Sai time to eventually come to terms with her situation and then to think a few questions through to their inevitable dead ends. One was, why had Jose left fleet training to become a geologist? Washed out? Thrown out? Dropped out? Another was, what had happened in this world when the Jose of her own world had died in the scouter accident? Had it been just a matter of timing? Had someone said or done something differently? Or had they simply not gone? And the nagging one, where was the Saida Gurch who properly inhabited this world? Was she over there, trying to come to terms with Jose suddenly dead a year? Or had she been displaced and no longer existed in either world? As night purpled in from the east, they stopped and made camp. Though traffic was infrequent, fogs and dust squalls had caused drivers to lose the road in the past, so they expanded their tent a couple of hundred meters away. 
pressurized and brought up to temperature, it was a comfortable plastic igloo. Joe smiled self-consciously over the two containers of self-heating soya she was tending. What? What? said Sai, still watching her. You've never seen me before? Not for a long time. Sai smiled. A minute passed. The soya containers began to whistle and peel. Joe said, Have you thought about what we discussed before you left on your last trip? What did we discuss? said Sai carefully. The year-long gap opened up before her. There's no need to be obtuse, Joe said with a touch of irritation. She pushed the readied container across the tent floor. You know what I mean. Yesterday morning, when I saw on the news what was happening to your ship, I ran outside and tried to see it go overhead because I thought it might be the last time I'd ever see you. Sai thought of saying something like, It looked worse than it was. But she'd been at navigation and saw her carefully calculated subspace hole stretch and twist into chaos. She knew how close they'd come to crashing into Mars. And yet, she knew she'd do it again and again and again if the result were to be the same. She said, It looked worse than it was. That's not the point. The point is it could have happened. Tell me, have you considered what I asked you? Unsure what she meant, Sai thought quickly, putting together what Jose had said in her message. Your way of life frightens me sometimes. And the fact that she'd left the fleet sometime in the last year. Sai took a punt. You mean resign? I mean just that. What a change. Three years ago, Jose had started in the same training program and had been just as eager to get a position aboard one of the new plane-class frigates. But of course, Jose hadn't been part of the Gartino genetics program and hadn't been genetically engineered for the job, hadn't been ingrained with a touch of the mad militarist, hadn't had her life mapped out before birth to this single end. And three years ago was before the Battle of Bellatrix, and the Battle of Rigel, and the Battle of Capella, and Deneb, and the Orion Rift, and Procyon, and— What's more, you have people shooting at you, Jose continued, as if reading Sai's thoughts. That's why we shoot at them, Sai answered defensively. Anyway, I wouldn't call the enemy people. Jose, you know I was mixed and cooked in a test tube specifically to do what I do. I can't just quit— Especially not in the middle of a war. Hardly the middle. The war's almost finished. I don't want to lose you in some stupid tail-end mopping-up operation. And you don't have to do what you do. You could always get a position as an astrogator. I am an astrogator. Yes, in a warship where you're also the fire control officer. Yes, and a damned good one, too. My point exactly, Sai. When you're out there, people and ships become targets. And targets are fast numbers in your head. You're a trained killer for the state. They made you as a weapon, not a person. The day you wake up to that is the day you'll resign. Sai didn't need to wake up to this fact. She knew it already, and knew there was no escaping it. The meal was eaten in a silence broken only by remarks on the falling temperature outside and estimates of the remaining distance to Viking. The stars were brilliant through the transparency of the tent. Shortly afterwards, Joe said, Good night, and pulled her sleeping bag up over herself. Did you see us? said Sai. What? said Joe, snuggling down. Did you see us go over when you heard the news? No. You were too far north. How our love must have grown, Sai thought, to survive so long, so diametrically opposed. When Jose was asleep, Sai called her father on her suit radio, told him she was all right, not to worry, that she was hiking across the Utopia Plain with Josephine. She asked about her four brothers. She made a point of the number, to make sure they were all alive and had not become sisters in this reality. Yes, they were four. They were alive. They were not sisters though two of them now had different names. As for her father, he sounded the same, whether in this reality or any other, an old man, long since a widower, never perturbed at anything, never moving from that little Martian moon. Afterwards, Sai stayed up a while to watch Phobos, penny small in the sky, rise in the west and flip backwards into the east, rushing through its phases, crescent, half-moon, full, 
until it disappeared into the shadow of Mars. She opaqued the tent and turned in. The ground was vibrating, steady trembling. Sai cleared a patch of the tent wall and peered out. It was pitch black with night fog. Jos, you awake? Yes, said Jos in the dark. Who could sleep through this? A quake? Not likely. Mars is geologically DOA in that regard. They sat up, pressing their palms to the tent floor, feeling. Sai cleared bigger patches and saw the lights, frosty and blurred, tearing along the road one after the other. Looks like a convoy of heavy vehicles. Into the Utopia Plain? What for? Joe shrugged sleepily. Maybe they're making for one of the deep water bore stations. They're in a damn hurry, whatever it's about. The silent lights streamed past, disappearing into the west. Next morning, they found not the slightest trace of tracks. Dust! Sai had been leading the way and so saw it first. A swirl of red dust looking for all the world like a smudge of blood pushing over the horizon to the north. She stopped with a little kangaroo hop. Jos almost ran into her from behind, despite the warning shout over the radio. Jos took one look at what was coming and started breaking out the tent from her backpack. As Sai contacted South Me admin, she mentally went through their rations and survival gear. Dust storms, she knew, could blow for days, planetary ones for months. They were much more prevalent in the southern hemisphere, while the big ones only occurred during the southern spring. And right now, it was winter down there. But there was no telling what terraforming was doing to the climate, and unlikely storms had to be prepared against. Within 30 seconds, Jos had their tent pressurizing. Their check with weather information before leaving had found no warnings posted for the whole northeast of the planet. Fair weather, they'd said. Light winds from the west and noonday temperatures reaching negative 10 degrees. It was, after all, the northern summer. Which was exactly what South Me was telling Sai now. Light winds from the west, no dust storms in sight over the whole northeast of Mars. She was inclined to believe them. The dust rising in the north hadn't risen very much. It seemed very concentrated, very local. The smallest dust storm she'd ever seen if storm it was. She cranked up magnification in her face glass and zeroed in on the cloud. Belay the tent, Jose. I think it's a vehicle. Jose moved to her side. Coming this way? No, heading south or southwest. The movement of the dust was evident now, as was the metallic framework nosing briefly in and out at the boiling leading edge. Sai took a few shots of it from her helmet camera, then imaged a map of the Utopia Plain on her glass. On its present heading, the vehicle would cross the road far ahead of them and plunge southwest into the plane's dead heart. Maybe it's the rover. There was a hint of humor in Jose's voice, but not much. The what? Haven't you ever heard the legend of the rover? Jose paused to set her helmet video tracking the distant, dusting thing. It was Earth's eighth expedition to Mars. The mothership landed on Phobos and sent a crew of ten down to the surface in a shuttle to set up a base camp. One day, a fuel tank ruptured and the shuttle exploded. The ten were marooned. The mothership wasn't designed for a Martian landing, you see. Wait on. That was way back. What's it got to do with that? Sai pointed to the dust cloud, elongated now and sprawling rapidly away. They all died, you know, Sai. Except one. As the CO2 built up, they took pills or just walked outside unprotected. Except one? He was the last one alive, and drove off in the surface rover they used for long-range exploring. Just drove off to nowhere. Five years later, the Tenth Expedition recovered the bodies in the base camp, but the last man and the surface rover were never found. Some say it's still out there still driving on computer control over the plains and in and out of the canyons with a dead man at the wheel. It would have broken down long ago, Jose. It's lost. It's... it's at the bottom of Mariner Valley. Joe shrugged, a gesture nearly lost inside her suit. Others have seen it down the years. Now maybe we have to. The dust cloud disappeared into the southwest, leaving a rosy plume 
hanging in the air, but taking its mystery with it. You're right, he said, which explains why Evelyn's been dead six months. Sai and Jos were resting in the center of a patch of sand, cleared of the ubiquitous red rocks. Jos was making a routine call-in to South Me, while Sai was checking their position by neutrino line fixes on her face glass map. Viking by noon tomorrow, she said confidently, as an outside call chimed in. It was, as she expected, Captain Brown answering her earlier message about what she believed the distortion wave had done. He said, You're right, which explains why Evelyn's been dead six months. Sigh, hesitating, asked, Your wife is dead? I've just spent the last 24 hours trying to find out what happened. Apparently, she died in a silver fever epidemic last year here in Styx, which, in our reality, happened over in South Arcadia. As she listened, it struck her that he didn't sound as sad or as shocked as she would have expected him to be at such news. In fact, in some ways he sounded... relieved? She said, You are taking this very well, Ralph. Don't get me wrong, Sai. If I'm sounding callous, I'm not. I'm sad that my wife in this reality isn't here, but it's because she died in this reality and not our own that I'm... He trailed off vaguely, a second later his voice coming up strong again on the beam. Have you lost someone in this reality? Your father, perhaps, or one of your brothers? Actually, Ralph, I've gained someone. Jose Manxman is alive. There was a long silence. Then Brown said, I see. So what did our subspace expert have to say? Yes, said the captain with a curious edge of caution. I checked with Mr. Womack, which is how I know you're right about the distortion wave knocking us sideways. Look. No, never mind. Enjoy yourself. The beam broke off abruptly before she could make any reply, or even ask, Never mind what? It left her wondering uneasily. Sai stepped out of the wraparound of the recycle shower. 11.4 she said, glancing at the outside barometer. Pretty good, eh? Not so long ago, our highest pressure reading was only 9.1, and that was at the bottom of the Hellas Basin in summer. One day, we won't need those. She pointed to their vacuum suits stored in a corner of the tent. One day, we'll have all the subsurface water up and the oxygen unlocked from the soil and the atmosphere. Still a long way away, said Sai, toweling. Yes, I wouldn't hold my breath. They laughed. (laughs) Sai said, Do you find your work at Zephyria more rewarding than defense training? Jos, suddenly serious, said, I thought we'd discussed that, Sai. Sai bit her lip. She said, Sorry. Without really knowing what for. She had to be careful what she asked Jos, not knowing what had passed between her and that other Seidegerch over the previous year. She fell to thinking on what the other sigh had been like. Not much different, surely, she thought. Joe seems to have seen no difference in me, though I can see such a change in her. But Sai knew she was thinking of Joe as she used to be, when their love had been new and had died still new. As she thought of this, she was surprised by a spasm of jealousy directed at that other self, the other sigh who had known Joe in both senses of the word, for longer than fate had allowed her ever to do. She shrugged it off as a meaningless emotion. There was no other. There had only been a gap, an absence, and now she'd returned. Sai stretched out on top of her sleeping bag and began drying her legs slowly, having noticed Joe staring at her. She half rolled toward her, knowing Joe would lean over and begin to caress and kiss her. But Joe didn't lean over, and with a little shock, Sai realized it was not her nakedness Jos was staring at, but the white, jagged scar on her left arm. The scar from the meteor that had holed her scouter a year ago in the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt where Jos had died. Expectations of sex were instantly replaced by expectations of Jos making some comment, asking some question she had no idea how to answer. It was too evidently an old scar from a major injury. 
There was no way she could... Jos got up and climbed into the recycle shower without removing her shorts and skivvy first. She did this inside the wraparound and flung them hard over the top rail. Something wrong? Sai asked. No, nothing, said Jos in the tone that said, yes, everything. The shower splashed. The recycle motor hummed. Standing on tiptoes, Jos put her head over the rail and said quietly, I only wish you'd stop wearing it like a tattoo. Sai regarded the scar on her arm. Wearing it like a tattoo? What the hell did she mean by that? It was just a scar. No, perhaps it was more than that. Yes, perhaps she did think of it as a memento, one in her rite of passage. Look at this. Look, I've been through the wars too. I know pain. I deserve my place. Not that it mattered to the people she worked with, who would probably never see it, but it meant something to her. Yes. But hardly a badge of bravery. More a souvenir of a stupid and wholly avoidable accident. No wonder it upset Jos. So what happened when the Jos of my world died and the Jos of this did not? The shower stopped. Jos stepped out, wrapped about in a towel. Tucking her left arm under her knee, Sai said, I'm sorry. Yes, me too said Jos, conciliatory. She paused at the end of Sai's sleeping bag. It's not your fault. Heaven knows it's not. But you have to admit, it's a constant reminder. Sai lay back on her sleeping bag as Jos returned to hers. So it seems the accident happened in this reality as well. But to me only and not to Jos? Was it that close call that scared her out of fleet training? Questions, questions, questions. None I can properly ask, because I'm supposed to know the answers already. She would call the captain, she decided. See if he could access operational records. See what happened to trainees Manxman and de Gerch on that day last year. Dr. Norsk would have the authority to check her medical... She looked up in surprise to see Jos kneeling beside her, smiling. She said, I think you had something in mind a moment ago, didn't you? and let the towel slip from her shoulders. Viking! The joyous shout roared through Sai's phones, interrupting Beethoven's fifth in its second movement. Viking! Three or four jump steps brought her to Joseph's side, where she stopped and stared out to the north. Viking! Viking! They shouted together, and the horizon three kilometers away glittered with metal in the morning sun a tiny spot three kilometers ahead at the end of a side road, glittering in the high-angle light of the late morning sun. As they bounded toward the ancient machine, three-legged, squatting in the sand, they made out that it was not alone. Something as big as Viking itself stood or lay beside it. They stopped about a kilometer away and took in the view on high magnification. The rover. Holy shit, Sai, it's the rover. As irrational as it seemed, as illogical as it was, the vehicle parked beside Viking did look old, was grubby with clinging Martian dust, had a figure at its wheel who was thin and skull-white through the transparency of its helmet. Then, a second later, she wasn't sure what it was, because it was no longer there. They approached, taking small, cautious steps a couple of meters at a time. Viking stood where it had landed 342 years before though now domed over with thick plastic to protect it from the driving sand winds. The pads of its three feet were buried deep. Directly beneath its hexagonal body lay a sheet of cracked red glass where the landing rockets had glazed the sand. This is made of pure history, Joe said, awed. Sai nodded in mute agreement. History. The dish antenna angled up as if still listening for instructions from faraway Earth the long robot arm touching the ground as if with a gesture of ownership, the American flag painted on one panel and still bright in its red, white, and blue, probably a result of some restoration project. They looked for vehicle tracks, finding a few, but they were old, nearly filled in by the wind. This is not the most popular tour stop, for sure, said Joe's, setting up the hollow camera. Too remote for most trippers, but it does have its fans especially among the history buffs, and especially now, in summer. Maybe that's what we saw. A tour buggy of Earthies. 
Did you see it leave? Okay, then. It was the rover. Which way do you want it? Take the hollow. The holograph was taken. Joe and Sai, togged up in full vacuum suits, standing, smiling beside Viking 2. Canberra region. Northeast Utopia Plain. They took pictures of Viking from various angles. A Viking in themselves. A Viking in its red Vista background. They set up their tent to have a proper lunch, eaten and tasted and felt with the teeth and the tongue, not squeezed from a capsule into a plastic nipple sucked from a tube. They called South Me, told them they'd arrived, but said nothing of what they saw or thought they saw. Then the dust began to rise in the south, a small hurrying cloud, distant but coming near. When it was two kilometers away, a balloon-tired vehicle veered left out of the cloud and slowed, leaving the high, boiling dust to stretch out along its old course under momentum. The vehicle stopped beside Viking in the exact same place, in the exact same attitude they'd seen that other vehicle standing. It was dusty and not the most recent vintage, but Northwest Region Ranger was stenciled down its side, and the lanky, blonde-haired man in the pressure bubble waved to them, friendly. And Joe said, It's Hill Cortenhorse. Who? Hill Cortenhorse, one of the rangers responsible for the Northwest. He sometimes does the supply run to Zaviria. They ushered him in through their little airlock. Hill Cortenhorse removed his helmet and said, As I live and breathe recycled air, it's Joe Smanksman. By the living Harry, you're a long way from home. We're a long way from anywhere said Jose, regarding the endless nowhere outside the tent. This is Cy de Gurch, my soldier girl from the Interstellar Fleet. We've just hiked it from South Me. Well. He made an odd gesture with his head to Cy, something between a nod and a courtly bow. Then maybe you can help me. An hour ago I got a garbled message on the beam about a starship coming down around here. My equipment's been playing up something chronic, you see, and I've got no idea what's happening. Either of you seen anything like a ship coming down? Which ship? Asked Sai. Most of the people she knew worked in space. No saying, Sai. Not even sure it happened. Message was pretty broken up. We saw some sort of vehicle racing along to the west, about a hundred clicks south of here yesterday morning. No idea who that could be. Unless it's someone else out looking. His mouth curved in a grim little smile. Maybe you saw the rover. The rovers in Mariner Valley. Joe showed him the steals they'd taken. Hill shrugged. No idea. Were you parked here by Viking an hour ago? He shook his head. I just arrived from Arcadia. Then there's another ranger. Sai began. No other in this area. At least, I don't think so. Mind if I use your beam? Go ahead. But we've just been talking to South Me, and no one said anything to us about a ship down. South Me still knew nothing about a ship down when Hill contacted them, nor did his base at Arcadia far to the east where he thought the original alarm had come from. I must be going mad, herring about the desert after crashed ships that never were. Poor dear. Never mind. Stop to lunch. We were about to have some solid food for the sheer spite of it. And to celebrate said Sai, breaking out what she called the good stuff, algae, steak, and rice. But there was more to Sai's selection than a sense of occasion and accomplishment. Algae steaks take the longest to self-heat and eat, and Sai needed time, time for conversation to be steered so that Hill could ask questions. She couldn't. It's just as well I used the algae steak and rice, Sai thought. Hill had much to say about being a ranger on the Utopia Plain, its aches and pains and fortunes, its idiosyncrasies, the people he encountered and the day he saw the rover. It wasn't until their algae dishes were all but licked clean that Sai's conversational opening finally came along. Yep, from West Utopia to Mount Olympus, Hill was saying, hardly pausing for a breath of recycled air. That's my beat. And, of course, south to Zyphiria. I'd take you for a bit of a grand tour next time I'm down at your station, Jose. But your lady might not like me whizzing you off like that. He gave Sai a quick wink. I know what Navy girls are like. Jose laughed, 
Sai smiled demurely. So, how long you two been together as a couple? Almost three years. Solar years, I mean. We met during training, said Sai, jumping in. Training? Jose never told you? said Sai, sounding as innocent as possible. We were a couple of 15-year-old trainees at the Stick City Defense Base, both specializing in astral and interdimensional navigation. She glanced across at Jose, whose mouth had set into a tight, puckered-in slit. The phrase, staring daggers, came to mind. So how does a navigator in the Defense Force become a civilian geologist in the terraforming project, Jose? A moment of desperation flickered across Jose's face. There, um, there was an accident, she said in a quiet voice. I decided to get out while I was still alive. We were hit by meteors during scouter exercises in the asteroid belt, Sai said, and surprised herself because for the first time since the accident, she felt no pain in speaking about it. Quite apart from getting an answer out of Jose, this was actually becoming therapeutic. You were lucky to come out in one piece. Sai said nothing. That might be pushing Jose too far. But then Jose said, I was lucky, yes. But Sai got hit in the arm, didn't you, Sai? For a moment, Sai thought she was going to add, Show the nice man your scar. But she didn't, and there followed an awkward silence. Then Hill said, And you stayed in and finished your training, did you, Sai? Sai shrugged. I'm a Gartino. She admitted her genetic origins as if saying, I'm very brave, or I have no brains, or I have no choice. Later, as Hill Cortenhors was backing into the airlock on all fours, he said, I'm off down south for Waterbore 4 now, then tracking it across to Stick City. If you want to get your stuff packed, I'll give you a lift. You can catch the mono there for South Me. Beats loping back, eh? Left to themselves, Joe said, did you really have to bring up the scouter accident? And do you have to keep avoiding it all your life? So you made a mistake. Do you wear your guilt the way you say I carry my scar? She was guessing here, riding the momentum of Hill's questions. She waited and watched for Jose's reaction. You were always better, weren't you? The unexpected bitterness hit Sai like a slap. What? Better. In navigation, and ordinance training, and officer training, and flight instruction, and hell, even in bed. I see, said Sai quietly. And why do you think I was better, Jose? Hmm? Because my mother's egg and my father's sperm were meddled with in a lab before they were allowed to come together. Because I never really was a little girl like you were once upon a time. You wouldn't want to be like me, Jose. Okay, so you took the lead with that scouter flight when you may not have really been qualified and made a mess of it. You failed. You quit. She almost made a question out of quit, but there was no reaction from Joe's. Sai went on, feeling she had something now. So my arm was smashed. You took us into the meteors, sure, something anyone could have done. But I could have maneuvered out if I hadn't been so shit-scared and only half-qualified myself. My injury was my fault. No, that's not the lot of it, Sai. I panicked and left you. Panicked? Unbidden, the events as she had lived them ran again through Sai's memory. The thwack of the meteor holding the eggshell hull of the scouter, skin and bone flying like shrapnel, a sudden fog of blood, her suit closing down instantly over the injury. No pain, not yet. The flashing damage lights on thrust and lateral control. The view screen showing Joseph's ship, grazed by small rocks, as she turned toward, trying to nudge Sai's scouter out. Someone yelling in her helmet, maybe Jose, maybe herself. Then the big rock hit, and Jose and Joseph's scouter were a million scattering pieces, which were scattering still in that other universe. Sai reached out and cuddled Jose. Nothing happened you could have prevented. I should have turned toward and nudged you out. No, you did the right thing. One day, I'll tell you how I know, but right now isn't the time. Okay, so maybe you're not cut out to be a trained killer for the state, but look at it this way. In some other universe, you did turn towards to nudge me out of the meteors, and in that universe, you died. Mars lost a budding geologist, and I lost you. Now what's the point of that? 
They donned their helmets, depressurized the tent, rebottling its air. The hike out to Viking had been a challenge to reach a goal. With that achieved, hitching a ride with Hill Corton Whores back to Stick City didn't seem like cheating. Home couldn't be reached quick enough. They crawled outside where Hill and his vehicle were nowhere in sight. South me and Arcadia say we're crazy, said Sai. Maybe we are, said Jos, gazing round and round. There was not so much as a receding dust cloud on the horizon. They'd signaled South Me, who said Hill Corton Whores, far from being anywhere near Viking Two, was cruising the sand out to the east, and no, they still knew nothing about a ship coming down in the Utopia Plain. Corton Whores called that in as well a half an hour ago, South Me said. Have y'all gone crazy out there? Arcadia also admitted to receiving a query a half hour before from Hill Corton Whores about a crash, about which they had no knowledge. Arcadia then called Hill Corton Whores and confirmed he was far to the east. He denied having been near Viking Two and having met Jos Manxman inside a Gurch there. His radio was working perfectly and had been since the beginning of his patrol, five days before. He denied having received a call about a downed ship or making a query about one, even though Arcadia told him they had plainly heard him do so. Arcadia, exasperated, then asked if they'd all gone crazy out there. Later that afternoon, Joe saw something glittering far ahead. They'd struck out for Waterbore 4 to the south, where they hoped to catch a supply run back to the South Me. Viking lay 25 kilometers behind them, and too much desert sprawled ahead. They loped steadily on with loud music playing in their phones in an effort to obliterate thought. The appearance and disappearance of Hill Corton Horse, and then his denial of everything from too great a distance had upset Jos with its inexplicability. Sai too was distressed, but with her, it was because there were reasons. Time had fractured and let her slip sideways. Now maybe it was sliding back and forth, one reality to another. Was that how it was? Like a pendulum, like water finding its own level, was time, her time, coming back? Was that what Mr. Womack had told the captain and the captain refrained from telling her? because it would have been too cruel? Yes, too cruel then, too unfair now. And then Jos called in something glittering in the afternoon sun far ahead. Sai bounded up to her. Where? Jos pointed, but even on full magnification, Sai could only see red rocks and red sand and nothing else. Sai, the desert up ahead swarming with people and vehicles. There are suborbitals landing. That glittering... It's scattered metal. Joe started off in great leaps, leaving Sai standing scared and alone, staring at empty desert. Jos, she whispered. But Jos was now well into the debris field, passing the people setting up temporary shacks and working amid the twisted shards of starship hull strewn around the edges of a brand new crater. Then there was Hill Corton Hors, sitting by the hole as if he'd been there for hours. They looked at each other in bewilderment. Where did you go? Jose asked. Where did you? I turned around and you'd packed your tent and disappeared. Along with this... He gestured to the activity around them. We've also had parties out searching for you and your lady the last three days. Three days? What are you talking about, Hill? It's barely been three hours. Hill shook his head and peered down into the crater almost a kilometer wide. She came down three days ago. Hit hard. Popped out of subspace too close, they say. Jos, cold as time, spun around. Sigh! There was no one behind her in the desert, and nothing to be heard but the ghost of a whisper call her name and say something that might have been, I love you, and then silence. For a long time, only silence. And then a young woman's sudden hysterical crying. Utopia Plain dropped out of the pink, noonday sky of Mars and belly cradled in Styx City, 1,300 kilometers southeast of the rocky desert from which the starship took her name. Medical personnel boarded and removed five injured crew members. Shortly afterward, 
the rest of the crew left for a suddenly well-deserved shore leave. Lieutenant Saida Gertz stepped through the forward hatch and walked down the pressure tunnel with her bag slung over her shoulder. Captain Brown ambled down after her, joining his young lieutenant at the spaceport windows, where they looked ruefully back at the scorched, buckled metal of their ship. A close one, said Brown. De Gertz said nothing to this. There was nothing to say. She was the navigator and knew intimately how close it had been. Abruptly formal, she said, Permission to leave, sir. Permission granted. Going home? To Phobos? Probably. Haven't seen Dad in... She trailed off, overcome by a growing sensation of deja vu, which, by a sudden odd expression, she knew her captain was sharing. At the comm office, Captain Brown found a message from his wife, saying she'd been delayed, that she'd be there presently. Dr. Norsk had news of the birth of a baby girl to his great-granddaughter on Earth. For Lieutenant de Gertsch, there was a data wafer of a middle-aged man saying, Welcome home, Cy. A simple message from a straightforward man, her father. She turned to go, then hesitated with a feeling that there should be something else. A vague expectancy of there being another message. Something from somewhere she'd never been, from someone she hadn't seen in a long, long time. She looked again. There was nothing. And now, a word about today's story. The Road to Utopia Plain was the second Cyta Gertz short story I wrote, following right after The Battle of Layla the Dog, also podcast by the Doonstief. Cy first appeared in a space opera novel I'd self-published earlier, so for this story I went back to it and mined some of her background, in particular the death of her girlfriend Jose in a training accident. Some years ago, I was at a science fiction theater night, and during the interval, a woman approached, pointing a quivering, accusatory finger at me and said, So, you're Rick Kennett. A charge to which I pleaded guilty by reason of insanity. Did you know, she went on, that you're the only Australian male science fiction writer to treat lesbianism in a positive way? God, am I? I thought. What a weighty responsibility for my young shoulders. But it did make me feel vindicated. At about the time I created the Psy character, I'd seen three instances, two movies and a book, showing female homosexuality as a very bad thing. The women either dying or switching sides for no apparent reason. So I wrote Sai as a young woman happy in her sexuality, who didn't get killed off because of it. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Well, thank you for uh, listening to that story. Or who am I speaking to right now? I would assume the listener. Well, hey, listener, how you doing? What are you doing after the show? I'm turning this stupid podcast off and not thinking about it for another, what, month and a half? Oh, that's right. <laughs> this is our first episode of the new year. So everybody, hey, happy 2009. I'm looking forward to some great things this year. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen? There's a million possibilities, right? Manxman. <laughs> uh, I have no comment. See, at some point you're supposed to point out that it was 2013. But. Yes, it is 2013. When you tell me that I'm supposed to do it, that's when I do it. That's, that's right. how it's good the, I am at uh, this whole okay. interplay thing. Oh, come now. By, by 2013, we'll all be speaking Chinese. <laughs> 2013? What kind of a crazy sci-fi number is that? Like anyone will be alive by then. The Mayans already predicted the world will be over. I'm sure between now and then we will all move to Mars. And this story will seem so quaint and dated. Yeah. It was written in 1994 after I, all. I, hate, I wish that he hadn't told me that because, yeah, I just I, I looked at all of this silly technology that we passed by. I, Those yeah. data wafers. Do you get wafers with it? What? It's a bleeding albatross. Of course you don't get bleeding wafers with it. All right. Did uh, Renee provide us with a list of who did voices? Or? Yes, there is a cast list. Okay. That's usually the case. Yeah. That's all. I'm just answering your question. 
But hey, would you like to read the cast list? Yes, I would love to read the cast list. Okay. That's all. Just just answering the question. <laughs> oh, sir, read the cast list. Whatever you say. Our cast list for today goes as follows. <clears throat> the narrator and Captain Brown was played by Rush Outfield. Did I really sound like that? You sure did, Bruce. <laughs> Dr. Norsk and Sai's father was played by Big Anklevich. Whoa, whoa, did you really say it like that? Sai de Gerch was played by Renee Chambliss. She was much better than the side of Gertz we had in the last episode. Oh, yeah. It's like night and day. That one just phoned it in. Jose Manxman. Manxman. Was played by Starla Hutchton. Wait, have we had Starla on the show before? Starla Hutchton actually has not <laughs> appeared on our show before, I don't think. But she is appearing in a future show. I do recall Brian Lincoln talking about it. Hmm. So coming up. More Starla Hutchton. If you like this, then you'll love the next one. If you liked Pretty Woman, give Green Card a try. Yeah. And lastly, Hill Horton Whores. Y'all going crazy out there? No, no, I'm sorry. Horton Cores. <laughs> Hill Horton Whores was played by Dave Robison of the Roundtable Podcast. But it's a shame he's not got an, a future appearance on our show. Turns out he does. What? That's right. Stay tuned for more. All right. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if that's going to help or hinder. Speaking of help, did you want to make an announcement? I'm sorry. What? Well, this is the first episode uh, we've had with a sponsor. We have a sponsor? Tell me more. Well, you were the one that made the deal. But uh, yeah, this week's sponsor is the Siri application on the new iPhone. Oh, and now, a word from our sponsor. Yes, go ahead and roll that, please, announcer man. And now, a few words about Siri from Big Anklevich. Siri, what's on my itinerary for today? Big, you have work tomorrow morning at 9.15. You have an episode of The Dune Steve that is now 13 days overdue. Also, you must return your Blu-ray copy of Tinkerbell, The Secret of the Wings, to the Red Box. Uh, right. Uh, I read it that from my daughter. Sure you did, Big. Uh, anything else, Siri? You have six unanswered messages from Rish Outfield. Uh, delete. Done. Also, you need to remember to put the sheets in the dryer. All right. Thanks, Siri. No problem, Big. Oh, another message coming in from Rish Outfield. <sighs> Put it in the spam folder. My pleasure, Big. That reminds me, Siri. Answer me this. Uh, Rish says that parachute pants are what MC Hammer wore. I say they were the nylon pants with all the zippers from the breakdancing era. H who's right? You are, of course, Big. I knew it. I remembered the break dancers like the heavy nylon material because it wouldn't stretch or Have tear and all the, the dance children? moves they had to perform. I think they got their name because it was the same material they used to make parachutes with. You are right, of course, Big. Yeah, well... You also owe Andy Dilbeck a copy of your story, Big. Oh, that's right. I'll get right on that. No, you won't, Big. Come on, now. You sound like Rish. Next, you'll start saying totally wrong things about fashion and music, including the most ignorant statements about things I grew Have up with, but she only knows from video websites made by people who were born during the Clinton administration. He dares to correct my knowledge about Kajagoo. Have you checked the children? Seriously, if I had a dime for every time I had to... Wait, what did you say? Have you checked the children? Uh... No? Is there any reason I could check on them? No, Big. I'm sure they are fine. Right. I tucked them in just an hour ago, and then I started work on my podcast responsibilities. Your message board responsibilities, you mean? Well, yeah, well... And watching those YouTube videos. Oh, one or two of those. Seven. Six of which you had watched before, Big. All right, Siri, that's enough. I know I should be using my time more effectively, but... Have you checked the children? 
Siri, stop it. It's starting to creep me out. I'm sorry, babe. No problem. I know you're just a program with limited responses built in, but sometimes I forget and actually think I'm talking to a real person. One who gets me in a way that my wife never could. Have you checked the children? All right, that's it. I'm checking the damn kids, okay? Pfft, stupid busybody AI program telling me what to do with my time like I don't get enough from that from Larby Gallagher. No! No! Siri! Wow, that was a serious sketch. <laughs> hey, that ain't funny, man. <laughs> oh, that, that's painful. Yeah. But that won't keep us from cashing the check. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, so thank you, first of all, to Renee Chambliss for producing that. I mean, it's it's work to produce a story. and A uh, lot. She is right now, like, professionally doing voice work, reading audio books, but she's one of those models that shows off the new sports cars on the weekends. That's right. She's a hand model, too. She actually did get a check from Apple for hand modeling the phone. That's good. Okay, well, she's congratulations. She's really rolling Renee. in it now. But congratulations us for her doing that for us anyway. Yeah, seriously. Her, her busyness. Because like when you and I became busy, we just didn't do the show. Yeah, we just fell apart. I crapped myself, actually. <laughs> Yeah, that was what you were busy cleaning that up. Uh, <laughs> oh man, was it a mess! <laughs> so, uh, do you, do you have anything you want to say about the story? What it, I'm trying to remember the history of this story. I believe this is the third Seidegert story that he sent us. It is. Yeah, the first one was kind of out of context. You know, we just didn't get it. I mean, it, it, it was one of her adventures and we, we didn't get it. And then the second one was Layla the dog, yeah, which we both loved uh-huh. and did as our 100th episode. And then this one, I read it and I sent him an email saying, oh yeah, it's ours. We'll, we'll take it. And I don't think you even heard it until the day we sat down to read. Yeah. yeah, I think that is true. And we've done that way more than we used to. It used to always be, had to be double checked. Had to have the stamp. Both the B and the R had to be on there. But yeah, there's there's been several now where we're just like, no, he's, he wants it. Yeah. No, it'll be fine. And then when I read it, I was like, oh, man, I have to do this. <laughs> That's how it works, man. It's a it's a collaboration. We were talking about that uh, recently on, you know, we wrote a story together. Okay, it wasn't even recently. Yeah, well, I think it was 2011. I You know, I have no idea how people collaborate. I don't because it's hard to write it's work and it's you know creatively exhausting and all that and if you also have to argue your point how could a book ever get finished if you're like no 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 no, it can't end that way or no you know he, no it, you're thinking of the wrong guy and all that just oh that's why <laughs> uh, i guess we don't collaborate very often i don't know yeah we haven't done it a lot but you had a point i think oh it just there's got to be compromise and all that stuff in this partnership kind of thing. And sometimes there's going to be stories that I dig and sometimes you can go f*** yourself. <laughs> but not all the time. I mean, sometimes oh, there, most. there's the, the R and the B <laughs> stamps on, on, on some episodes. Uh, well, okay, They're coming from an outsider's perspective on this story, well, what did you think? I really enjoyed this story. You know, we always talk about there's the alternate dimension where whatever, where this where happened instead. Buy, where you can still buy instead. Twinkies. Right. You know, we mentioned that. I swear, it seems like pretty much at least once every time that I speak with you, an alternate dimension gets mentioned. You talk about the darkest timeline. So this story is really fun because it is an alternate dimension story where basically gravity rings ripple down the hull and Corton whores. Sorry, (laughs) I got a little lost there. It's one of those alternate dimension stories where you know somehow these people get sucked into this other dimension and they live a few days in there before things right themselves and they go back which is a really interesting way to do it there was a story that was on i think it was escape pod which doesn't make sense because it was about magical wine that made you go back in time but it was escape pod (laughs) it was escape pod should have been on podcastle but it was on escape pod 
Yeah, it was about this magical wine where you drank it, and depending on how much you drank, you would go further back in time, and et cetera. And there's something about that story, and I, th- I guess it's just that whole alternate dimension thing to it. It just keeps running through my mind, and I keep thinking of other ideas, other things that could happen with that same setup. I actually have two separate story ideas that came from just hearing that story and thinking about it for... I swear I must have heard it like two years ago or more. I don't know how long ago it's been, but the alternate dimension thing really interests me. It's really a cool, fun thing to do. I guess the the alternate history isn't just what you're going to change and stuff like that. And and I'd already even done an alternate dimension story for even ever hearing that in the first place about a guy who gets sucked out of his dimension and comes into our dimension and all of a sudden everything is alternate dimension to him. He's like, what the heck? This didn't happen. These people died. And our money is not green anymore. It's colored. Although I guess our money is kind of colored now. It's not really so much green anymore as rainbow. Well, everyone on that transport died. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. You know, it's really sad. I recorded that off the television Christmas 2011. Okay. And I've had it on there so that we could watch it in Christmas 2012. And we never did. I had it saved the whole year so that we could watch it. And now it's January. Dude, we didn't do anything in December we were going to do. Yeah, that's true. I did have Christmas. Oh, okay. Well, I was planning on having Christmas and I had it. So I did achieve one thing that I planned. (laughs) Yeah, I love the idea of the second chance of somebody who died. And if you had somebody close to you who died, your mind would go there all the time. You know, you'll hear people where like a significant other dies and they wake up and every single day they have to come to terms when they wake up that the person is not there. Right. And that's awful. And and I'm sure anybody would give anything to wake up and the person is there, even if it is just a temporary thing, even if it like that country song goes. Oh, let's hear. Come on. You know it. The one where the 15 year old boy gets seduced by the grandmother. Uh, Hell no, Rish Outfield. I was going to say, one more day. One One more more time. time. I don't remember how it goes beyond that, unfortunately. I'm not a country fan. But yeah, the guy who would give anything for just one more day. But then he doesn't want to have one more day, because if he had one more day, then he'd have to have one more day after that, I think, in the end. He just has to get over it, I guess. Okay. Well, I used to like that song, but thank you for breaking my spell. You're welcome. Now you'll never listen to country again, and you'll be better off for it. (laughs) I don't know if this would have been a bigger deal had we known all about Joe. See? Joe's? Joe's? Josephine. She went by Joe's. If we had known all about Joe Sweden. Which was hard to figure out how we were supposed to say it, because it was shortened J-O-S. So we're like, Joss? Jos and we finally went with Jos because that would be short for Josephine, I guess. But but I just I've always loved the 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 what might have been dimension where somebody who's dead isn't dead or somebody you know the the girl that got away didn't get away. It's a and country I, song called What Might Have Been. Too, okay, stop there? it! <laughs> what the heck is your country song deal? You're killing me, man. I don't even know country. How do I know all these country songs? What's my deal? Okay, just just so you know, <laughs> we are never, ever, ever getting back together. Oh, no. I can't take it again. Wait, there's a country song called... Man, I feel like a woman. <laughs> Stop it. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. <laughs> so so I, I just, I, I love that and that she knows that... That one's actually a kind of a crossover song. I don't think it really counts as a country song. Well, then, of course, the Taylor Swift <laughs> one doesn't count. That's more what I was referring to than the uh, Shania Twain one. But sorry, go on with what you were actually saying before I interrupted you for the 10th time in a row. Random Travis Tritt song <laughs> reference. Okay. Insert now. That's what she said. It didn't take Psy long to realize what had happened. And that's good. You know, she made the best of the time that she had. And then at the end, she forgot. It's not like suddenly she had the memory (laughs) of those extra days. Right. And what might have been or whatever. She just had this sensation of deja vu. And that sucks. (laughs) I just, I, oh, dude, that's so bad. But you'll see that kind of crap in science fiction, especially science fiction television, where it's like no one will ever know. 
the changes, the things that we did to save the world or whatever. They, right. they can never know. The alternate ending uh, to Terminator 2, where Sarah, it's August 29th, 1997, the day that the world is supposed to end, and it doesn't. And she feels like running through the streets and shouting to people, and don't you understand what's going on? But instead, she just gets drunk. Done. Which is about as good. I don't know. It's it's, it's kind of a bummer ending, the, the, the alternate ending, because we see that Sarah when she gets older, looks really, really bad. Like really bad old age makeup is what's going to happen to her in the future. Uh, she doesn't actually get old. She just gets really bad at doing her makeup and it makes her kind of look old, but... But the, that kind of thing of, you know, no one can ever know that we made a difference or that, you know, that things could have gone horribly wrong. Or I, I, in this case, I guess, I mean, for the captain, that alternate universe was horribly wrong. But for Sai. Was it not preferable to the universe she's from? Probably. I don't know. It seemed like even though they had their few more days, their relationship wasn't just happy. It wasn't just bliss. It wasn't like, oh, yay, I get one more day with you. I try not to think about what might have been because that was then and we have taken different roads. And everyone considered him the coward of the county. <laughs> but instead, they fight with each other half the time. But that's what real life, is, a that's... real relationship I've read, would be like. <laughs> that's true. You know, to her, but... it's just another day. Although she at least had, uh, Jose at least had the near miss of almost losing sight in that ship accident or whatever to make her grab on and say, ooh, one more day kind of thing. If not... I, I don't know. I, I, I always think of that. You know, you wake up and everything's the, the way it's supposed to be and how great that would be. But for them, it would just be another day. Right. And it's like, of course, I'm not going to stay home from work so I can have intercourse <laughs> with you. I mean, come on. But it does seem to me like their relationship may not be long anyways. Like if Sai just remained in this alternate world forever with Joe's. The way the story was going, it almost seemed like, well, they're going to be breaking up in like less than a month anyways. I mean, this is the last days of this relationship, which is a resurrected relationship. So I don't know. I mean, it was... It was also a long distance relationship. Right. So the next time Psy, alternate Psy, ships out to, to go kill alien bad guys or whatever... They, and they have to put this argument on hold. Mm -hmm. And then when she comes back, there's a little bit of, oh, hey, uh, absence makes the heart go fonder. And oh, hoo, hoo, let's get together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that uh, was lame even for you. <laughs> and then, you know, they can argue the next day, which right. is going to prolong it. Like you I and guess. I had a friend who married some girl just, you know, to one up you. <laughs> and the only reason that his w marriage lasted was because he never saw her. She never saw him ever. They'd see each other like on every other Saturday. So they fight for like a little bit and then they don't see each other for two weeks. And by the time they get back, they like can't remember the fight. And so it lasts a little while. And then they remember and they fight again and then they don't see each other for two. And so the fight never is enough to end the relationship. Is this how it actually is to you in your experience? Or are you just saying? I'm just trying to figure out how this prolonged their relationship. This whole never seeing each other. Well, Do you disagree? Well, it's possible. I mean, I don't know. See, I never saw her, ever. <laughs> I would see him from time to time, and I'd see her maybe once a year. Yeah. Which is so strange, because he lived in my town. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. And to never see her, because she was always off in New York, or always do, you know, doing something. That's probably what it's like to be movie star marriages and stuff like Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie or Brangelina. They just or see each other every time they adopt a new kid. Bennifer or what did, they had to be some kind of Justin Bieber Selena Gomez name, right? Was it like Bibamez or Oh, I like Bibamez. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's my you know, favorite these Mexican people... <laughs> dick too. Whoa, your favorite Mexican what? I hope I can edit that so it sounds like dish. <laughs> Wow, today's show sucks more than one of Rish Outfield's pickup lines. Um, but anyways, yeah, like those people probably never see each other. I mean, like they're married, but only if they're actually appearing in the same film do they <laughs> get to see each other. One of them's home with the kids or the other one's home with the kids, but never both. See, I don't get that. I mean, these people aren't Bruce Willis. They don't work 350 days a year. But okay, yeah, I, don't, I, mean, I just assume that that's probably what it's like, one of those kind of relationships, because like one's in Tunisia shooting or something, and then 
they come home and they see each other for a day or whatever and then oh it's time for me to go i'm shooting in the andes so do you think that alternate Sai and alternate jose their relationship is is on the is about to end well, or, or al- does alternate side die? In alternate side was on that ship that blew up. So yes, everybody on that ship died right. because you weren't there to say hair. That's you know. right. Because alternate side, it really did get them that time in that alternate universe. Or at least that's what I, I'm pretty sure is the case. Maybe Rick Kennett is going. Oh crikey, that big Agnovich doesn't know. Vegemite from a hole in the ground. All right. But anyways, that's what I assumed is what happened at the end. So, yes, their relationship wasn't going to last much longer. Their relationship actually lasted longer than it should have because alternate Psy came and gave her a couple of days. Gave her one more day. That's right. One more time. (laughs) And now all she could do is think about what might have been. Uh, You guys are the all-singing, all-dancing crap of the world. That's right. Anyway, sorry, this is getting ugly. You said it, Big. <laughs> I assumed that, you know, if she didn't die on that ship, I don't think their relationship was going to last much longer because Sai was not. You saw her reaction to that, you know, you need to give up. And she's just like, Pfft, yeah, but this is not the same Sai. Maybe the, the alternate Sai had is heard this all the time. Well, no, I mean, if you had something to go home to, you're, you're a military guy. And they want you to do another tour, and you've got nothing at home. And so you're like, of course, I'll do another tour. Let me kill some brown people. But if you've got some hot wife that's like, you know, I wish you didn't go out, you've got something to go back for, maybe you would say, okay, I'm not. And and obviously, she's genetically engineered to kill brown people. Right. This is like, okay, you're Jason Bourne. And they say. (laughs) But her mindset might be totally different because she has something that's worth fighting for. And, you know, that sending her, what are they called? The the hollows? She's oh, sending her hollows and stuff. Oh, I was you know, say saying, I miss wafers. you. And, and yeah. And, and she get wafers with it. Stop. It's an albatross. Of course you don't get wafers with it. I, I'm just saying that something as, as catastrophic as losing the person that you love or that you're falling in love with changes you as a person. So our Psy is not the same person as their Psy who had a totally different chain of events of dominoes that fell after her lover wasn't killed in that accident. And yes, okay, she noticed that Joe's wasn't the same person because they had had all this time together and other Psy wouldn't have been the same person either. Okay, that's probably true. So maybe things would be different. There's no way of knowing. After all, she had two brothers with different names. That was one of those things that I was thinking about. The whole, that, that, that story... That I mentioned earlier, the wine drinking time travel magic thing. Yeah, check the show notes for that. Oh, yeah, I guess I better put that in there. Just the idea, you know, you go back in time a little bit. Like, let's say you're going to, oh, I'm going to change this one thing. You go back in time to like five years ago and you change the one thing. And yeah, like there's no way that you can possibly have the same child, even if you're like, okay, my child was supposed to be born in February, so we got to start doing it at this time. Because when sperm goes in, there's a bazillion of them. One of them actually combines and makes, the, you know, so it's Wait, just, Should I be taking notes on this? Yes. Probably, this is the first I've ever heard. You probably should. There's a bazillion. So there's no possible way that you could ever have. The, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, no matter if you do everything the same, there's going to be some little tiny thing that you do different. And so, therefore, four brothers, but yeah, now they have different names. They're obviously probably not the same person. They're different people. Maybe even the other two, which, yeah, they got the same name, but they're totally different people. She would go to Phobos to meet her family, and all her brothers all have, like, different color hair and bigger noses or whatever. You know, they're totally different. One has a big ear. This one has a pointy kind of ear on that side, or he's way shorter than he was before, even though he's still named... Simon. All right. I was trying to think of something more funky because, you know, Psy Something is, more Phobos. Okay. Yeah, some, something more Phobite. Phoben. Ooh. <laughs> Although Psy... What do you think Psy is short for? 
Silene or yeah, I think he said. I think he said Silene, didn't he? In the I think it was like the computer said Silene de Kerch or something, which was cool because that was Renee's voice just changed with the tempo and the pitch, I should say, and roboticized and stuff. That's always fun how you can do that kind of crap. Well, see, he's and I didn't know this until today. He wrote a novel, a Seide Gerch novel. So he may know way more than we know about this and about well, her history and what her brother's names are and all. There's this stuff. at least a third story. I mean, we've read a third story, but I think there's got to be several more in the uh, long line of Side to Gertz tales. I think there's probably in one of our correspondences with him that he's mentioned, "Hey, there's this many stories, and this comes up later," kind of a thing. And that's the magic of creating a world. We talked about that in what was the episode. <laughs> was it the dead of Tetramana? Or? There was an episode where they had created a whole new world that referred to other towns and other things. And new new ex- horizons to pursue. <laughs> Don't go there. I'll, you know, I'll chase them anywhere. There's time to spare. You stole my joke from me, darn it. And, and I'm going to continue to pound it into the ground. <laughs> Let me share this whole new world with you. Okay, go. Unbelievable sight. Oh, that wasn't an invitation to sing. Indescribable feeling. Give me a break. Soaring, tumbling, <laughs> freewheeling. Come on, announcer man. Through an endless diamond sky. No more singing, Rish, for the love of Hitler. We had a good announcer man to sing something for us sometime. Surely you can't be serious. I don't know. I, I, that's cool. It makes me want to be a writer. It makes me want to come up with all sorts of possibilities and little things that I know that nobody else knows. And I remember in 77, there was this making of Star Wars documentary that aired on television. Uh-huh. And at one point, Harrison Ford is talking and he said, when I got the part of Han Solo, George Lucas told me that Han Solo used to be part of the Empire. And he was like a stormtrooper or something like that. And he saw these guy, these other stormtroopers mistreating Chewbacca, a Wookiee, which was like a slave race in the Empire. And he freed Chewbacca and like beat up these other guys or killed him or whatever. And ever since then, Chewbacca had had like this life debt and they'd been best friends or whatever. And my head just went, oh my gosh, where is this story? Where, how have I never heard this kind of thing before? You know, that's one of those things where you create a universe and you create backstories and things that we'll never, ever see, that we may never know. But Harrison Ford knew this little story. Uh, yeah, that makes me want to be a creative person. That makes me want to spin off all these stories. And something that Abby told us, because Abby came over and did a couple episodes that will never air with us. <laughs> and she was talking about that she knows like a backstory and little things that may have happened to like every single character that she writes about. And she puts forth to her listeners, you know, if, hey, if there's any characters that you're interested in that you would like to read a story about, mention it to me and maybe I'll do one. And she's just waiting for somebody to say, oh, yeah, the third soldier, Big Anklevich, <laughs> read with the English accent, write a story about him. So she'd be like, you know what? I've been thinking about third soldier and here's his backstory. And, you know, he was once a man and now look at him again. It makes me want to be a creative person. It's too bad that you're not. I know. It's just it's not fair. It's like, <sighs> you know, what's really too bad mm. is you're not a non-creative person either. Oh, OK, well, that's somehow more offensive. <laughs> All right. We've got an incentive episode where Big got a one. Yes. You guys can listen Check to. that one out. That one's rad. If you've ever heard a story bad enough to earn a one. Well, you certainly haven't on the Dune Steve. But you can on but an you incentive But you can episode. on the incentive. Is that not an incentive? But that's not up, right? That's not going to I don't think it'll be quite ready. But, you know, you, you can start donating now and we'll give it to you later. You well, all right. Let's, Sorry, let's, your meandering tangent put me to sleep. Uh, thank you, announcer man. Whatever you just said, I agree. Um, <laughs> do, does that stuff not make you want to, to create, to go out and, and create whole new worlds? Yes. New Sorry. horizons to pursue. Yes. All that stuff. And the girl part, too. Like a shooting star. Unbelievable sight. Come so far. Indescribable. Over oh, that, that the girl? Soaring, tumbling, freewheeling through an endless time and sky. Oh, no, you, don't you dare close your eyes. Prepare to die. Wow. Hold Ladies your breath, and it gentlemen. Gets maybe we should use this for the incentive episode. You could hear Rish sing both parts in high speed as okay, he well, tries to work well, out the, the words. Well, the, the in story his that you wrote, that terrible thing that, that, that you said, oh, I wrote this in high school and it's terrible, but no one will ever hear it. You had a whole new. Oh, every time you cr- had created a universe that was your own. Trademark, Big Anklevich. Uh-huh. Bruce Anklevich. 
And I was just like, wow, I've not done that before. I've not created a whole universe. I've created like, you know, like a you like little mythologies and like stuff. Like a potosphere, I've... but not really a whole universe. All right, damn you. You talk. Not a whole Whedon verse. All right. You guys think it's so easy to podcast <laughs> two hours every six weeks. Yeah, tell Go me about Go ahead. It. That's tough. <laughs> All right. Well, we've talked a, a long time about You wouldn't this, even and, comment on that? I, and we probably... I still want to hear what you thought when you find out little details like this about creating stuff. If it makes you want to be creative or if you okay. just realize that you can't so that you just say, oh, I never wanted to write anyway. <laughs> that actually does interest me a lot to hear these kind of things where you hear just a whole like our last episode too we talked about secret santa and just how much more there could be to that and i just think oh man i wish i'd come up with this idea so i could do this and i could do that and that would be so fun and we got that guy trying to sell comic books so i could totally just throw it his way and it would be taking over amc and they'd be making secret santa episodes instead of walking dead episodes or something i don't know like you said i have done that with some things in the past like the story that i rewrote for i think wasn't it an incentive episode we used it for there's something out there uh yeah Stop. that story was just a kind of a throwaway thing in a much larger world that i had created when i was in high school I have a a few other worlds that are kind of like that. In high school, I came up with another, with a fantasy universe. That is a fantasy! That was a similar kind of thing. And, you know, recently, you were talking, and hearing this story actually makes me want to do that again. We were talking about doing a... Space space opera! opera, 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 opera. Yeah, space opera. A story about the ragtag crew flying their their ragtag ship. I need another word other than ragtag because I've used it. Snot rag? Okay, there's snot rag ship around the, the universe and solving crimes and... Wait, I don't think that's part of it, the crime thing. Putting right things that once went wrong. Hoping that each leap will be the leap home. That's it. But yeah, we wanted to kind of maybe make our own Firefly or our own Star Trek, our own Babylon 5, our own... You didn't see that episode of Castle where they went on to the uh, science fiction convention. <laughs> no. And there was some show they invented that it had a name. It was like Babylon 5, except for it was like something 11 or I can't, I can't remember what it was. But it wasn't a Firefly reference. It was actually a Babylon 5 reference. It was more like a Babylon 5. He did mention, like he comes on, he's like, what? This show had like 12 episodes. Didn't even have a full season. Who gives a crap about a show like that (laughs) kind of a thing? And he's like, give me Star Trek or something else. Or that one Joss Whedon show. Did he really say that? Yeah. Pretty good. I love it when they do that on Castle. But yeah, we were were talking about doing that. And I tried to shoehorn it into the universe that I'd come up with when I was in high school. Actually, I think I came up with that one when I was in college. But... And I think it still works, but you're just like, no, you came up with the universe, so F you. I did, although I said F, not F. Oh, that's right. So that'll never happen, I guess. But nothing is stopping. Oh, I'm sorry. Your your inability to write anything is stopping. <laughs> Ooh, that's a stumbling block. Ooh. Almost as bad as my non-talent. I don't know. If we took your complete apathy and inability to work. And my non-talent, we could create a huge nothing that would we take over a the completely world. worthless person instead <sighs> of two completely worthless people. Ninety-seven percent worthless. <laughs> the, the the podcast, of course, is in its death throes. But if we were going to be around till like 2013 or some crazy, super Sci-fi futuristic year. Robotech world like that. I would say, you know, Rick, send us another one of these stories and we'll do another one, you know. As send long as... us another one of these stories, Rick. I would even do it in that voice, or maybe I just did, apparently. <laughs> but, uh, you we'll know, he's... we be damned if we won't do another one of your stories. <laughs> as far as he was concerned, this podcast was his birthright. He'd be damned if he'd give Brian Lincoln his birthright. Yeah, we can change it to The Walking Dead. <laughs> oh, hey, that's clever. So I'm sure you didn't make it up. 
Wait, you're the non-talent. I'm the complete lack of being able to do anything, so I could have made it up. The cleverness don't enter into it. Oh, darn. Rick has been with us for a long time. That very first story that you bought that I had nothing to do with had to have been our first year, right? Yeah, it was... You had nothing to do with that story? I didn't hear it until it was done. Oh, wow. That's we didn't even do voices on that one. Yeah, we had Cameron Harsborough do it for us. How do you remember that? Because I'm. Um, oh, my so gosh. Smart. The quality on those episodes was. Yeah, it was a little low. Little? <laughs> but our quality on almost all of our episodes was a little low. Oh, you days. take that back, sir. Holy monkey, those were unlistenable. <laughs> Um, but it was a good story. No, well, I have to take your word for it because I can't hear it. Something of Castle Rock, the, the hills of Castle Dale High, the seas of seas of Kennet Dale Castle on ABC Tuesdays. <laughs> seas, seas of, of Castle Hill Castle Road. Hill Road, Australia. We, <laughs> we love, love you. you, Amen. And he did the the uh, the one that was on the was it a submarine or it was some kind of ship? It was, it was a, on a ship. Oh, that's right. That was his one non series story. Non series. Thank hey, you. Tied it into the sponsor. That's <laughs> you know what? I take it back. Ninety six percent worthless. <laughs> did you want to say something about the new year? Like, I mean, I know in past years we've been like, oh, we're going to podcast and we're going to write every single day and we're going to grow three penises and you know things like that, which are just as likely. Peni. Well, yes, that's right. It's going to be Edward Peni hands. I don't know. We don't have to. We've got the ankle cast for that, so we don't need to worry about it doing it on this one. What the scum <laughs> is an ankle cast? <laughs> Someday you will know, my friend. Someday. All right. For now, you don't. Mm-hmm. And so we will move on. Three. The sad thing is I'm already breaking those resolutions that I've been trying to. Oh, because you drank soda today? And you ate up. A- giant crock of chocolate today crock of chocolate yes. i didn't know they kept chocolate and crocks it's when you put two shit loads together it makes a crock wow no I, I i've been saying i'm gonna write and i actually even tried to work on it a little i've done it a couple of days in a row i mean today's what the third i don't know i finished my christmas story today <laughs> good yeah it's the third of January today, as we record this. Um, sorry that it didn't come out until February 23rd. <laughs> Two days, I did work on trying to get uh, my story put together that I, I swear I'm going to write. Because... The Simon and Garfunkel story? Yes. The Be- silver and gold, silver and gold. <laughs> it, I know it's something and something. It's sunny and gray is the uh, title of the story. Oh, yeah. I got you, babe. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. one of my favorites. The the thing is that I I remember saying this once, I think, where I was like thinking, man, I haven't been having a lot of ideas recently for new stories. It's kind of weird. but And I finally realized that it must be because my ideas are just like, no, we're not coming because you don't write the ones that you get. Recent- wait, wait, you wrote a story about that one time. I did, yes. Where your own brain turns against you. <laughs> that's right. So uh, that's one of those things that I'm trying to overcome because what's really a problem right now is that I am coming up with new ideas and I work it all out and then I don't write it. And then I get another idea of, oh, this would be a really good story and I start working it out and then I haven't written it. And now I've got another story that's come that I've worked out and I, I got to write it. And so if I don't get going, yeah, maybe my own brain will turn against me. And uh, try to kill me because I will not write the ideas that it is producing. Or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I'll just realize that I'm 97% worthless. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's one of those things I'm, I, I, I'm hoping to overcome this year. Although it's the third and I slacked on purpose today. On and purpose? I knew what I was supposed to do. And I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do this other thing instead. Is this that other thing, the podcast? No. Because, no. yeah, I was fully hoping you wouldn't call so oh, yeah? we didn't have to get together today. Of course, I didn't realize that Renee had already finished the episode, so we had something to do. But good. And we couldn't let the good people at Siri down either. Oh, that's true, yeah. All that money they paid us. This feels like the longest episode ever. It kind of does, huh? But, uh, yeah, anyway, so that's my my... New Year's. I'm going to freaking write this year. I swear. I swear it to you. But yes, that's my New Year's thing. 
And your New Year's thing is to not lie about having New Year's resolutions, it seems. I don't not care. Not pretend I... to, to have plans that you're not going to keep. I don't know. I mean, I could resolve to put out more of my stories and all that for people to read. And like I said before, we had Abby on the show. And yeah, she did all but titty twist me to say, you know, <laughs> put your stories out there. You know, you can charge 99 cents for them and you get 30 cents of every dollar that Amazon makes. And it's like, just do it. And, and I have on record me saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. We'll totally do that. And then we didn't. Well, we kind of, I mean, we have it halfway there. We just got to figure out what it, we can see a Moby on. I thought it must have been a, a Nook because it didn't want to work on my Kindle. But I think it's supposed to be a Kindle. I don't know. For some reason, I can't get the file to work. I probably ought to send Andy an email about that and say, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I didn't even try. <laughs> that shows you how you didn't even try. try that's been a long time since we said that there was nothing i could do it it is coming and i i'd have to say that at the very least you have made significant improvements i would say two years ago or less you wouldn't have done a a, a goddamn thing a thing you wouldn't even have promised you wouldn't even have said oh yeah sure i'll do that <laughs> you would just not You'd say, yeah, but it's scary, and so I won't. <laughs> but th those days have kind of gone away. You send your stuff out there. We read the band. Yeah, seriously, we read the band, which sadly is still your best work today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we read that, and people got to listen to that. You've got various stories our freaking dune steve blog has stopped being the dune steve blog and it started being the hey i've got this story here and this story there and this story here and this story there blog unfortunately none of those entries are mine you didn't even try well you see you lost the password you're no longer able to log in <laughs> i lost a lot more than that so you know you're obviously on your way and i think things will just continue to get better as long as you don't give up and curl up into a ball and hide somewhere. But hey, you finished your Christmas story today, and come on, we're already ready for next year now. We don't need Josh Roseman anymore. Screw that guy. Right? Am I right? No, Josh Roseman is, uh, I'm sure he's got a, a bunch of stories just as good as Secret Santa, just if we'd only open submissions, we could read them. <laughs> I, you know, I was thinking of this conversation we had like four years ago, or might even have been longer. And I'm trying to remember what inspired it. Maybe you remember what inspired it. But my, my recollection is that there was a particular Metallica song that had a cool title. And you said, you know, can you think of a, a story you would make with this title? And I can't remember what the title was. But it was really good. You know, For Whom the Bell Tolls, let's say, or something like that, which is... <laughs> But that I could just, make a good story. I, but gosh, that just, even a book that lit my imagination on fire, and I was just like, "Oh my gosh!" Maybe Call of Cthulhu. That that would be a good story too. Somebody ought to write that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'll, you know what it was? It was the thing that should not be. That's what it was. The thing that should not be is actually the title of one of those fantasy. You know how I said I had the fantasy world. Okay. That's well, what was going to be the so, title of all right, one of my this, fantasy this novels. This is all tied back together. But you, you said that, and I kept thinking about it, and I thought, wow, you know, if they have some really cool titles for their really awful songs, I'm going to look at it like a list of Metallica songs and, and, and see, you know, if any of them spark ideas for stories. And so I took like 20 titles and said, my goal is to come up with an idea for a story for every single one of these. So there was like Ride the Lightning and there was For Whom the Bell Tolls and there was Leper Messiah and all this, these things. I, obviously, I'm just making up titles now. Yeah. Ender Sandman, things like that. And just the other day, I was I found that. That list. That list and like, you know, my little paragraph on it. And I thought, that's what we've got to do for like a contest where we have like 30 days and somebody has to write a story, story and submit it to us. A short story, really short, but it has to be based on one of these Metallica titles. And then we do like a whole album <laughs> with like 12 <laughs> stories named after different Metallica ones. So anyway, I was just thinking if, if submissions were still open and I think you said that you might be amenable to still doing contests, oh, even yeah. though submissions aren't open. And I just thought that would be such a fun contest. Or if we did like one, you know, every other month, one Metallica title, everybody has to write a story called Through the Never. 
th- th- well, not that one. Of Wolf and Man. Of Wolf and Man. And then we podcast the one that's the best. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, it just it was a fun idea for me because I thought about all of those titles. And they, yeah, they have some really great titles that opened up avenues of creativity and, and despair. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think that you did really well last year. Basically, you just need to continue on, keep writing and keep trying to put stuff out there. If nothing else, we can do a lot of your stories on our very own show. That would be just fine. Why did I even show up today? Long, long episode. <laughs> Why is this so long? We're supposed to still read a story tonight. Okay, come on, come on, let's finish. Let's, let's, let's thank people for listening all the way to the end, because no one did this time. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. This is the end, my only friend. The end. The oh. end. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, the guy that did the voice that we didn't know. Thank you, the one that she said was distorted but sounded fine. Thank you, Rick Kennett. That's right. Thanks to everybody for uh, hanging around. And uh, can you believe it? We made it to 2013. Let's see what we can do. We're going to make it to 2014. This, I swear. No, we're not. This, I swear to you now. We barely made it through this episode. (laughs) Australia. 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 We love you. Amen. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. And don't forget, announcer man. Take two. Our cast list for today goes as follows. Did you fart? I farted so bad it hurt. <laughs> oh, yikes. <laughs> it burns. Oh, man. Anyways, we'll just forget about that little aside and move on. Uh, oh, saved that up just for you. Gross. Welcome to the show. <laughs>